Amen and thank God to him who gave us life today, who out of compassion and consolation, mercies that were made new, let you live another day. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more thankful I am for just being alive and well. Just thank God to this monumental man that I am honored to call brother and friend, and you ought to be proud to call leader and pastor. Will y'all help me right quick? Come on. Thank God for Dr. Thomas B. I told him I was so sorry. Last night, I did not recognize the better part of who he is. You know, whenever a man chooses a wife, it's really the better part of who he is. And I did not mention Lady Beavers on last night. Y'all give the first lady of this spot a big hand clap of love and honor. To all of the reverend clergy who are here, to Dean, to Mandy, all of you all who are here, Robbie, and all of these brothers, all the pastors and preachers, just lift your hands right quick. I don't want to get caught. I'll miss some names. Give all of the reverend clergy a big hand clap, a big hand clap. To the ushers who play, who stand so dutifully, and to these musicians who play so skillfully, to this choir who has blessed us magnificently, and to all of you who tonight stand faithfully, man, why don't you just shake two hands and say, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Matthew chapter 9 is our text. Verses 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31. Five verses. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. For those who were not here last night, we looked at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And we talked about raising Cain so that he can become Abel. As we talk about faith and family, we looked at our sons on last night. Tonight, I want to look at human infirmity and sickness. So if you would, turn with me to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Let's pray. It will read. We'll dig in together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, if I've sinned against you in word, thought, or deed, forgive me. Overt, covert, intentional, unintentional, mishap, or mess up. Cleanse me from this assignment. In fact, Lord, fill me with your spirit. To the point that what's in me from you runs off on this, your people. Lord, I pray for those with testimonies of your healing power that tonight, Lord, they would not keep it a secret. God, I pray for clarity in your word for those who need your healing power. Let, Lord, the nectar of the truth penetrate the human existence they have that healing might be their end result. I guess what I'm really praying, Lord, is this, have thine own way. Fix this moment so that it satisfies you. And God, if you're happy, we promise to be pleased with the outcome. It is in the name of he who lived, died, rose, reigns, and will rule eternally. In the name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. Amen. Matthew 9, church, verses 27 through 31. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto him, them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They say unto him, I love this part. Yes, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. 
And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man knoweth but they. When they were departed, spread it abroad his fame in all that country. Say amen for the reading. If you don't mind being nice and neighborly, Christian, cordial, and kind, find somebody's hand you don't mind touching about 20 more times tonight. Find somebody. Look at them in the face and say, neighbor, I am blessed and I know it. That's why I'm holding your hand. Because I want just a little bit of what he's done for me to rub off on you. Say, neighbor, I am here tonight because God is real. Tell them the preacher needs your prayers. All of your amens. Tell them tonight's sermon subject. I need him to do it for me. Tell three people, I need him to do it for me. I need him to do it for me. I, I need him to do it for me. Tell three people, I need him to do it for me. The grass withers. Flower fades, the word of our God shall last and stand forever. Thank you. You may be seated, ushers. Mendel's law of genetics suggests to us that biologically we are a portion of each progenitor. Uh, Mendel's law of genetics says that whenever you look at the biological construct of any human on the planet, you can thank their progenitors for how they look. If what they say is true, you can thank your grandmama for your hips. You can thank your uncle for your height. You may be able to thank your mother for the color of your eyes. You see, there's some things that just run in the family. There's some blessings that just come along with the territory. Others can hate and not appreciate it, but the truth is your granddaddy was handsome, your father was handsome, and handsome just runs in your family. You, you, you don't have to apologize for being cute. Your great-grandmama was cute. Your Grandmama was cute, your mama cute, cute, just. Good sense just runs in your family. <laughs> God help me. Uh, there are certain things genetically that we are inclined to possess. But let me just say this quickly, not all of those things are good. There are some things that come through family lineages that have been a part of the genetic construct a long, long time. High blood pressure just runs in the family. You don't eat pork, stay away from beef, drink plenty of water every day, and still your stuff is just as high as a kite pushed by high winds. And it's not that you're obese, you exercise, it's just some things that run in the family. I began here tonight in our discourse because not long ago, Dean, I ran across a member of our church where breast cancer and female problems just ran in her family. Beverly is a fifth generation cancer survivor. I thought somebody would have just clapped right on that note that she has been able to survive it, yet her daughter not long ago went for a regularly scheduled mammogram at only 32 years old. And when she came home from the doctor, she had to tell her mother they found some abnormality. They scheduled her for the much dreaded biopsy and she had to wait some two weeks to get her note to discover that, the, that what they had pulled from her left breast was malignant. Fear fell over them. And so her mother got in touch with her grandmother and they set her down at the kitchen table with cups of Starbucks. Can I just mash pause right quick? Sometimes Starbucks 
can brighten a crazy day. Just one good cup. And they set this young lady down. And here was what the mother and the grandmother told the daughter. If he did it for us. <laughs> I'm going to shout right there. Hey, y'all, this is my whole sermon. This is the whole thing. If he did it for us. And she cut him off and said this, I need him to do it for me. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I stand before a group of believers who are related in more ways than one. It's why our ancestors made certain we got to know the people in our family. Because you might be dating one of your cousins. But I am standing here tonight to simply declare before you that God is still a healer. That God is the God of every genetic construct known to humankind. And if God can heal your mama, and if God can take care of your grandmama, God can take care of you. Ladies and gentlemen, come with me hurriedly to the text. Because in this text, we witness the Lord doing it. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever want to shout yourself, just read through Matthew chapter 9 because the whole chapter says one thing. Jesus did it. Wait a minute. Let me teach it to you. So watch this. We're in a city called Capernaum. It's the village of Nahor. And the Bible says, Dr. Beavers, that these four men bring their friend to Jesus to be healed of the palsy. For those who know the story from Sunday school, you know that we don't know what his name was. We don't know how much he weighed. We don't know whether he had a good attitude or a bad attitude. But here's what we do know. They brought that joker to Jesus. And when they got to the house, ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus was inside, the house was packed. It was a good time for them to say, dude, we'll catch him next week sometime. We heard he's going to pass back through. But they were desperate, so they climbed up on the roof and started tearing the shingles off. They lowered him down to Jesus, and I just love this part of the story because Mark tells us Jesus looked up and said because you've got some crazy friends with crazy faith I'm going to forgive your sins and heal you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we know this he was toted in and he walked away. Y'all don't know when to shout. Okay, listen. He was packed in, but he strolled off. I don't care what you tell me, Jesus did that. When you read Matthew chapter 9, it's more and more exciting because Jesus runs into this dude named Matthew who's collecting taxes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he's the worst sinner of them all. He is a traitor, a hypocrite, a backstabber. He works for the government, and they can't touch him. It's bad. But Jesus says to these men, this one man, two words, follow me. I don't know about y'all, but can I put a pen in here and shout for me? I'm glad Jesus doesn't just choose clean, crispy, holy, extra nice people. I'm glad he picked some of the worst of us. Some tattoo packing, gold teeth wearing, pants sagging. I'm glad he doesn't just pick the deacon with the clean suit. He says to Matthew, follow me. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, here is what I can guarantee you. Jesus did it. And then he has enough nerve to sit down and have dinner with publicans and prostitutes. It's why you ought to be happy, ladies and gentlemen, that God has a table just for you. He he sits down and the folk from the religious sector, the Pharisees and Sadducees, peep Jesus eating with these unholy folk and then ask his disciples, why does your master kick it with people like that? Dr. Beavers, Jesus has good hearing. He hears what they say and then throws them a curveball low and outside. Here's what he says. If you not see you don't need a doctor. I didn't come for the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. 
I wish I had somebody in here that's a sinner that the Lord didn't save you and you know it. But just tell somebody, I ain't always been in church on Thursday night, you know. Just, the Lord had to work on me. Can I go deeper down and further in? Watch chapter 9 because Jesus is now leaving there and is confronted by a gentleman whose name is Jairus. And Jairus comes to the Lord and says, listen, my daughter is at home sick. She's about to die. Jesus takes off walking for Jairus' house and some unknown woman grabs the hem of his garment who's been hemorrhaging 12 long years. Don't you like miracles on the pass by? You know, if Jesus just passes by, that's good enough. She reaches and grabs his garment, and when she grabs it, he feels virtue go out of his body. He turns around and says, who touched my clothes? The disciples are slow. They never catch on. They say, Jesus, it's a bunch of folk touching you. But the Lord said, no, Somebody touched me like for real. It was a desperate touch. And he turned around and saw her on the ground. Here's what he said. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you say to God if you go to him sick and leave well. But here's what I got to tell you. It wasn't the doctor that healed you. It wasn't the cream you took. It wasn't the pill you popped. It was Jesus that did it. Wait, hold on, wait, wait, wait. He gets to Jairus' house and the daughter is dead. And so here's what happens, Dean. He walks in with the mama and the daddy and a couple of his disciples, a good little posse. When he gets in, he says, why are y'all making all of this noise? They say, because the girl dead. And Jesus tells them, hold up. That's from your perspective, not mine. I have to throw this in the gumbo as I'm making my rule. When you need healing, you got to watch whose perspective you look from. You got to be careful not to look from a stupid person's perspective. Everybody that's talking don't mean you always good. And some folk who mean good don't know what to say. Jesus says, hold up. She's not dead. Sister is taking a nap. They begin to laugh at her, Reverend Robbie. And Jesus does something that the church ought to do every now and then. When it's somebody in your family family that needs healing, you ought to put folk who don't believe out. Okay, this is a good part. Anybody need healing tonight? Look at your neighbor and say, do you believe this stuff or don't you? Because you can mess up my whole miracle. I don't want to sit by nobody tonight who got doubts and fears. I want to sit in the crazy faith section. I want to sit next to somebody who will say, come though what may, I still trust him. Where y'all at? Listen, ladies and gentlemen. He leaves that house and begins to walk to another. Listen carefully. And two blind men follow him. I like this Dr. Beavers because he asked these blind men a question. He said, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they shout these two words, yes, Lord. Can I just throw this in right quick? Can I tell you that sometimes we are as close as the next two words from our mouth? And I believe telling God yes is powerful. For those who need him in your family tonight, you ought to just throw up your hands just right quick and just shout, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, to your will. Yes, Lord, to your power. Wait, hold on. It's right in this text, ladies and gentlemen, because it's so rich. He then, ladies and gentlemen, touches them and says to them, you're going to be well. And the Bible says their eyes were open. Come here. This is for the folk who like to read the Bible. So if Jesus heals these dudes, which one is necessary for their restoration? His touching or is talking. You see, when you start reading biblical stories, you'll discover, Dr. Beavers, that some blind men he just talks to. Other blind men he might touch. So where is the healing in the touch or the talk? Can I tell you what's, what, what it really is? It's really not an either or or both and. He doesn't have to touch you to heal you and he don't have to talk to heal you. He just needs to be present. God help me. I need about 15 of y'all in here who will tell somebody the presence of the Lord 
is in this house. Woo, I'm about to shout by myself. Ladies and gentlemen, these men's sight are restored immediately. And then they, and then Jesus gives them instructions. Here's what he said. Don't tell nobody. Hush, zip it close, because I'm in a region that doesn't like me. Hold your peace. Keep it down. Don't tell. But when the Lord has done some stuff for you, you can't keep it to yourself. You have to tell somebody he did it just for me. I'm here tonight because somebody in your family needs to know what God can do. And God left you alive for you to be a walking, talking billboard of what grace looks like. If you've never been sick, you've never had surgery, you've never woke up in recovery, you've never had an ailment, an ailment or an infirmity, I'm going to catch y'all next year. But if you have ever been sick in your body, if you have ever been down and you had to have surgery, if you've ever had a moment where you were sick and couldn't and fix it, stand up right quick. And I want you to grab somebody by the hand and tell them if he did it for me, he can do it for you. <laughs> Find one neighbor's hand and just say, he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it, he did it. Be seated, be seated. Uh, he did it for her, I can tell. Uh -huh. How do you know when God is about to do it just for you? Can I, can I teach you this? Watch this. Number one, write this down, write some notes. Number one. He brings you to the place where you realize that you are where you are by divine design. <laughs> you got to be careful in your family because there's going to always be folk who believe God and folk who don't. And what happens is when you need healing, the folk who really don't believe this stuff will tell you stupid stuff that you don't need to hear. See, here is the truth. Listen to me carefully. God is still a healer. Did you hear that? Let me try this. All healing is from God. I don't care how you got well. If you got well, God did it. God, help me. But following Jesus can be frustrating because you'll see some folk in your family get well while you still struggle. And the ones who get well are the worst ones in the family. That beer, drinking, weed, smoking, puff, puff, pass, going, ain't gonna go to church half the doggone time, just as healthy as an ox. And you sitting up here talking about the Lord if you just make a way. It's frustrating. Keep do you feel what I'm trying to say? Notice the text. Let me hurry up and teach it. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, that you are where you are by divine design when you are close enough to hear the facts. Friends, these men are blind, but they can hear. So they heard about Jairus' daughter. They heard about the one with the issue of blood. They heard about the man who was on the mat. They were hearing about all of these miracles, but they were still waiting on God to do it for them. Can I please throw this in the soup right quick? If you can only shout for what God does for you, you don't have much of a worship for God at all. Sometimes you ought to be thankful just for stuff God has fixed in other people's lives. Okay, wait. We've been shouting all night long, but I want us to do this one with purpose. Tell your neighbor, this shout is just for you. This is for stuff God has fixed in your family. This is for healing God has restored your family from. This ain't even for me. This one is for you.
got to be close enough to hear the facts. Watch this, church. You have to be courageous enough to find a friend. They are two blind men. Okay, watch. I'm going to do it again. They're two blind men. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait. One more time. Third time for charm. They're, they're two blind men. Okay, y'all, if they blind, how they find each other? Don't you want to interview this text and say, if you can't see and I can't see, how you going to see your way to me? Watch this. Let me tell you how. Because people with familiar defects always find each other. In fact, it's why some of your friends, your friends right now. It's why you're sitting by some people right now. Because both of y'all got the same defect. Tell your neighbor, we're going to get fixed tonight. God is in the healing business. It don't make no sense to just be around sick folk all the time. At the end of the day, they share a defect. Watch this. Come here, come here, come here. Not only are they courageous enough to find a friend, but watch this. They are in consolation enough to follow Christ. If they are blind, Dean, and they are, then how do two blind men follow Jesus? Okay, watch this. That's not really the question you should ask this text. The question you should ask this text, Dr. Beavers, is not how two blind men follow him, but how men with eyes miss him. Don't you want to know? How folk who can see miss Jesus. But I have studied this because I knew I was going to preach at the star. And I know Dr. Bieber studies this book. So I did my homework. And Dean, what I discovered is the, the way blind men follow Jesus is the law of empirical regard. See, listen, you are born with five senses. See, taste, touch, hear, and what's the other one? Smell. I know you would know that. And when one of those dissipates or disappears, the other senses heightened. And so what happened was, was even though they couldn't see, they could hear well. And they discovered if they were close enough to hear his footsteps, he was God enough to order theirs. Come here right quick. Come here. I'm going to shout by myself. You got to be careful when your family needs God and when you need God, you got to be careful who you let order your steps. You better let God order your steps. I came, I hope there's somebody here that needs God. Anybody need God like tonight? Trust him, the Lord, with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes, I'm just trying to order your steps. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored stores my soul. The Lord is my light and my self. I'm just trying to order your step. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord my, touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, let him order your steps. Woo! I got to hurry up. You're where you are by divine design. God has you right where he wants you. It's not like you have forsaken God. It ain't like you've turned your back. God says, wait, you're right where I want you. Watch this. Can I go further down? Watch this. Number two, not only do you realize that where you are is by divine design, but you got to recognize that God can do it, but he ain't going to fix it your way. Uh. There are some things run through families, and I'm glad theology runs through mine. 
And I can hear my ancestors saying stuff that makes me shout now at 53 years old. Hey, Reverend Robbie, here's what I heard my ancestors say. Here's what they said. The Lord works in some mysterious... Yeah, hold on, y'all got the same cousins, don't you? This text, ladies and gentlemen, was one I did not equate to faith or family because of how it flowed. I struggle with teaching it, Dean. Here's why. I preach a God of compassion. Yet, my brothers and sisters, this is a harsh pericope. Jesus knows they are needing healing. But watch what happens. Watch this, Dr. Beavers. He makes them walk with no word. He doesn't say one thing. Isn't it deep, Doc? You would think Jesus would turn around and say, hang in there, fellas. It's going to be all right. This too shall pass. <laughs> God, I preach it so good. I'm about to shout. Hey, listen, listen to me. He says nothing to them. I struggle, Dean. I struggle hermeneutically, homiletically. I said, God, why wouldn't you say something to them? And isn't it deep when you need God even going through your own life? If some folk in here need God like right now, you ain't heard a word I said. Your neighbor just shouting and happy waving. You talking about what he talking about? How long he going to be up there? You know you ain't heard nothing. And it's, watch this. It is an affirmation. God isn't talking. But watch this. When you don't have have a spoken word talking, it's because you have an eternal word walking. He's not talking to them because he's holding their hand. He's close enough to them to feel his presence. Can I tell you why you haven't lost your mind yet? It's because God's been walking with you the whole time. Can I tell you why you haven't given hope up? I'm about to shout, I promise you I am. It's because I need some people in here who should have lost your mind a long time ago to tell your neighbor it's because he was walking with me the whole doggone time. Watch this, watch this. Not only is, watch this, he makes them wait with no, wait, wait while they're, wait, walk with no word and then wait while they're wounded. He lets their woundedness remain. But you have to ask this question, why? Because God gives every infirm person in this particular pericope a chance to do two things. Y'all ready? To receive what he has and recognize who he is. Uh, let me start with recognize who he is. They cry out, Jesus, thou son of David. Have mercy. Wait, hey, wait, 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 hold on. Y'all, you can't get happy about son of David unless you don't understand the fact that this is a messianic attachment, that this is not just some idea that says he's from Nazareth. It is an ideology that says he is more than just the man. He is the Messiah. He is the root of Jesse and the seed of David. He is the promised son of Almighty God. He carries within his human construct the hypostatic union of God and humanity, that he's God enough to heal me and human enough to understand me. And when they cried out, thou son of David, I believe it was something that moved the heart of God that made the Lord say healing is about to head their direction. But wait, not only did they recognize who he was, but watch this, they literally cried out for what he could give them. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I can get through this one section of this sermon. Because every time I get here, I shout, listen, I'm trying to hold it right now. See, they cry out for mercy, but they're blind. See, y'all missed it too. They don't say, hey, Jesus, give us eyesight. They don't even do that. They cry out, Jesus, have mercy. Hold on. See, y'all don't know when they get happy. If they're blind, why are they not asking for eyesight? It's because if you get mercy, you get it all. I know there are some people in here who don't understand, so let me go deeper down and further in while I got a little bit of time. Watch this. From Genesis to Malachi, the word mercy means the withholding of judgment. So when David sins with Bathsheba, he asked God for mercy. 
Why? Withhold judgment from me. Okay, wait. That's a good shout for everybody here. Because if God gave all of us what we deserve, would none of us be here? I need some people with flaws in their past, issues in their life, and struggles you got to work your way through. I need at least one saved Christian who can still cuss just a little bit. I need somebody in here with at least one messed up part that say, good God, help me, Lord Jesus, to lift your hands and say, thank God for mercy. He did not give me what I deserved. <laughs> I'm about to shout out. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. But hold on. Watch me. Dean, that's from Genesis to Malachi. But for Matthew to Revelation, mercy connotes, suggests, and is defined otherwise. It is not the withholding of judgment only. It is the bestowing of what heaven possesses. What they are saying to Jesus is, we know you're the king of kings. We know you the Lord of lords, and we know you got a connection with heaven. So instead of making a list of what we need, just give us what heaven has to offer. I need about a hundred of y'all in here who need everything heaven has to offer. To lift up your hands in this house and shout these words, have mercy, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on my family. Have mercy on my mind. Have mercy on my children. Have mercy on my finances. Have mercy on my walk, my talk, my worship, and my way. Lord, have mercy. Uh, I don't know how much time I got. Hey, watch this. I lost my wallet a little while ago. And I had to get all my ID replaced. I didn't realize how important a social security card was. Because I didn't had one since I was 16. I'm 53. So I had to go to the social security administration. It was a hot mess. Y'all not paying attention. Hey, y'all. I lost my wallet. And I had to get a new social security card. I couldn't order one online because it's been almost 40 years since I got it. So I had to go down to the social security administration. That thing was a hot mess. <laughs> Dr. Beaver spoke all in line, bad attitude, you know, smoking outside, cussing and stuff. You know, it was a mess. <laughs> God help me. I stood in line until we got all the way in. It took me about like an hour and a half. Then they finally gave me a number. I sat there in a the corner just saying, Lord, somebody recognize me. You ever want favor to find you? Please, God. You know, just somebody say, hey, Pastor Adolf. You know, nobody didn't say nothing. Nobody say nothing. So I just have to sit and wait and watch what happens. God doesn't let me go early because he wants me to see something. Y'all, this lady who was sick, they was finna skip her. And y'all, she just went berserk. She just went to Holland. Yay, somebody go help me. I said, hey. Yeah, she just lost it. The police ran out. I said, oh, she finna go to jail. It's finna be Michael Brown. It's gonna be bad. The police got around and she pushed him out the way. Hey, she pushed her walk out the way. She stood up. She just went to Holland like she had lost her mind. But do you know the people that was in the back came out? They came out. The boss came out. The person the under them came out. People with computers and laptops came out. iPads came out. They just started running out. I said, well, maybe we ought to all try this. You know what I'm saying? Maybe the reason why God doesn't show us the mercy he could is because we're too quiet in church. Maybe God is looking for some people that'll just shout like they losing their mind. Just, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. I'm finished, Dr. Beavers. Got to realize, got to realize he going to do it but not show what. Got to recognize that what yours by divine design. Tell your neighbor, say, you're right where he wants you. Can I squeeze his last principle in? You have to internalize that God is able whether you believe he is or not. 
I'm out of time. Let me just say this until it just rests in your spirit. God is able. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it again, don't worry. Because I know you, your pastor didn't said it, so I, I'm going to repeat it. God is able. <laughs> Woo, every time I say it, I feel better. I'm going to say it again. God is able. I'm going to say it for those who ain't heard nothing. I didn't say it all night. I'm going to say this just for you. God is able. I'm going to say this for the folk on your road who need God like right now in your body. I'm going to say it just for you. God is able. I'm going to say it for every walking and talking, breathing miracle here tonight. God is able. If you know I'm telling the truth, you ain't got to touch your neighbor this time. Make sure your breath is fresh. If it ain't Papa Peppermint in, look at him and tell him, God is able. <laughs> Dr. Beavers, look at the, how this text concludes, and I'm finished. The Lord asked these two blind men a personal interrogative. Here's the interrogative. Do you believe? Hold on. That's enough. Do you believe that I am able? Oh, y'all, y'all, it's a lot in that. Oh, my God. I, I felt this one time. I just shouted in my study. My wife said, what you doing? I say, the Holy Ghost is just showing me stuff. See, listen. Do you believe this personal? That I am is theological. Wait. If you don't believe that I am, you're going to miss the whole miracle. Because this is not just some ordinary I am. You see, when you study the Bible carefully, you, you, you have to use laws of interpretation. For those who are unfamiliar with them, you ought to take classes at Gray School of Theology. They're signing up people tonight. You see, the law of interpretation gives you the law of first mention, the law of further mention, and the law of final mention. So when you want to really understand what something means, go back to the first time it was mentioned. And when you hear Jesus say, do you believe that I am, the first time we see an I am is on Mount Horeb. And Moses has a stick and a bush is talking to him. And God speaks through this bush and says, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground you own is holy ground. Moses takes off his shoes and he introduced himself like this. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I'm going to go get the children of Israel out of Egypt and bondage. And Moses says, great, we've been needing you to show up. And God says, I'm going to send you to do it. Moses says, hold up, God. Who will I tell Pharaoh that sent me? And the God of that burning bush said, tell Pharaoh when you see him that same I am that spoke in the bush is speaking to these two blind men right now. And I argue, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know him as the great I am, you can't see the healing God wants you to have. And not from this text. You got to believe that he is the I am. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I'm trying to hurry. I got so much to say. But why he says that I am able, watch this, to do this. Let me close this. Everybody in here has a this. Your family has a this in your family. In fact, even though you look well, you have at least one this. The this in your life is what you need for God to put his hands on. The this in your life is what you need to fix that you cannot repair. I feel like being nosy. Anybody have more than one this you would like to have God's attention on? I argue, ladies and gentlemen, that if you don't believe God is able to do this, your non-belief could hinder and hamper your miracle. It's why you need to have faith even though sometimes you struggle. I need to believe that God can even if he chooses not to. Even if God says, I don't feel like it, I still know that if you wanted to, you could. <laughs> 
This next shout is just because God can if he wants to. This is for people who know that even if God doesn't fix it, he can if he feels like it. Give God a I know you can shout right quick. Hold up. This is just a shout that says I know you can if you want to. The antithetical reprise for this is that. That's why he's asking them this question. Because you can't have this without that. Dr. Beavers would ought to shout everybody in here tonight is you walked in with both this and that together. That is the stuff God's already bought you through. There were people in here and God has brought you through that already. You've been through that poverty. You've been through that sickness. You've been through that element. I feel like doing a roll call. If you've ever been through moments of sickness physically that puts you in the hospital, leap to your feet. You've already been through that. And if you are here today and you've ever been financially distraught, didn't have a dime, and now you got multiple accounts all around you. Jump to your feet. You've already been through that. And if you've ever been lied on, talked about, and misunderstood, and you didn't do nothing wrong, jump to your feet. You've already been through that. And if you've ever been let down and disappointed by people you thought you could trust, leap to your feet. You've already been through that. And if you've ever lost a job and God paid every one of your bills, leap to your door on feet. You've already been through that. And if you've ever thought about driving off a bridge and God didn't let you do it, leap to your feet. You've already been through that. Then take your right hand and wave it like you love God and tell God thank you for bringing me through that. The shout of the night is that if God brought you through that, you know he can take care of this. Ain't he all right? Is there anybody in here who can testify that God brought me through all of that? Where's all of that in here? Do I have any all of that folk back there? Any all of that folk up here? Any all of that folk over here? Shake a neighbor by the hand. I said find somebody's hand. Hold your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, he brought me through that. And if he brought me through that, I know he can take care of this. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? 